Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Wise Decision Maker Show, where we help you make the wisest and most profitable decisions. My name is Dr. Gleb Sapurski. I'm the CEO of Disaster Avoidance Experts, the future of work consultancy that sponsors the Wise Decision Maker Show. And today I'm joined by Tyler. Tyler, can you please tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do? Absolutely. Um, I'm Tyler Jordan, and I run Jordan Digital Marketing. Uh, which is a company I started as a freelancing shop and then sort of ballooned from there into now about a 30-person digital marketing agency focused on helping venture-backed startups in performance marketing and organic growth. Excellent. And I know that you do a lot with remote work. So tell me a little bit about your experience assessing the performance of remote workers in particular. Yeah, absolutely. Um uh, yeah, I started my business completely remote and I did it largely mm -hmm. because I wanted to find a, a work situation that fit my life rather than fitting my life around a work mm -hmm. situation. And as a result, we've had, and then once we started bringing on other people, obviously we had to start thinking about these sorts of challenges, how you mm -hmm. um, look at performance and rate people. Um, and so for us, we do biannual reviews we do reviews twice a year so we have them at a little bit higher of a frequency than in other places when i worked in-house and one of the key pieces that i believe in is making sure that people understand where they stand with the company mm -hmm. so we start at the very beginning with an alliance agreement that we work through with all of our employees when they first come on so that we can understand what their personal and professional goals are mm -hmm. and then from there we break out quarterly goals or rocks or okrs or everyone refer to them actually no wait, those would be uh, rocks, um, and then um, work through those on a quarterly basis, checking in on them monthly, and then every six months, every two quarters, have a review about mm -hmm. overall performance, um, and so that everybody understands like where they stand with the company and and within their role and moving towards the next opportunity. Okay, excellent. That's helpful. Now, within that context, as your people are performing, you need to make sure that there's a culture of trust. And that's something that a lot of leaders have difficulty with in a remote environment. So what do you do to create a culture of trust in a remote environment? I think one of the one of our biggest uh, core values, one of our most important core values is radical transparency with employees mm. and clients. And so just that was where all of this process is sort of born out of. So I believe to build trust, you have to be open and transparent and honest as much as you can with people. And so that's why we have like these additional touch points. Whereas, you know, when I've worked in office, in, in office mm -hmm. cultures, it's been a little bit less frequent than I think a lot of our check-ins are. Mm. And the intention there is to try and build trust and accountability and an understanding of, of how people are performing, because I think it's a little bit, uh, I don't know that it'd be easier, but it's more well understood if you're in office, mm -hmm. how you can communicate uh, there's like nonverbal verbal communications that might get across sure. in terms of like how you're being perceived or or how your work is being appreciated. And we're mm -hmm. we take a little bit more of an intentional approach to make sure that we are driving those points home on a regular, ongoing basis rather than leaving people wondering. So I think that's one of the issues that mm -hmm. I was really worried about when starting a yeah. remote work business was, you know, I've heard it described, I've heard some of when remote work doesn't work, I've heard it described as a group of people working as individual freelancers and not being unified by a solid mm. goal or plan. So the way that I've addressed that is by just trying to focus on over communication with our team members. So that's mm. usually, you know, that's how we've we've planned to handle that situation. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, let me follow up on that and uh, help me understand how you deal with conflicts or underperformance in that context so you talk about radical transparency mm -hmm. and you have those meetings that you have monthly what do you do when people underperform what do you do when there are conflicts well i think that's where the additional touch points have really helped out is so that mm -hmm. you don't let those issues fester and develop and 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 become bit bigger issues than they need to be we're mm -hmm. able to be a little bit more uh quick to handle those um uh, on like a monthly, quarterly, or half annually basis, so that people understand when they are off mark or when they are, you know, absolutely killing it. You know, on both sides, you want to make sure that people know that they're either falling short or exceeding expectations, and that that there's a plan for them and what you want to do. Um, so, if someone is not meeting expectations, we work pretty quickly to help work 
try to correct those and make clear mm -hmm. how they can improve those. And then what we do is we put together work plans that are essentially short-term roadmaps that allow them to identify which areas that they're falling short in. Mm -hmm. And then we create a simple like red, yellow, green uh, structure. And mm -hmm. it usually comes in the form of a Google sheet. And mm -hmm. um, it's clear where they are in terms of performance on on any given week and how they're trending and how like what the perception from their manager is as well. So um, that's usually how we handle stuff like that is just trying to get out in front of it mm -hmm. quickly rather than letting it, you know, faster, as I said, mm -hmm. um, and be open and transparent about it through the whole process. Okay, excellent. Now let's talk about the other end of things, which is professional development, not mm -hmm. correcting underperformance, but improving performance. What do you do to support remote employees and ensure that they still develop professionally effectively? Yeah, I think this is one of the things that we took um, a little bit of greater emphasis on earlier on than maybe we would have if we we're all in office together. Because I've worked for agencies where it was a relatively flat environment and there wasn't a lot of upward mm -hmm. mobility for your career. And so what we have is we have a fully fled, uh, a fully built out um, uh, uh, career track for everybody on both sides mm -hmm. of the house. We have like the organic growth piece and the performance marketing piece, and the rules mm -hmm. are not necessarily in direct parity with one another, but there is clear paths for each of them to go. Um, and we've actually also created IC paths versus managerial paths to try and understand and acknowledge that not everybody wants to go in the same direction. Um, mm -hmm. And what we do is within those quarterly goals and uh, biannual reviews work on defining what people need to do to get to the next level. Um, and those actually pretty similar to underperforming um, employees is we usually build out a roadmap for people to get to where they need to be as they get closer. Because a lot of times people get to a point where they're outperforming their role, but then they need to also adopt a series of habits or grow skills that allow them to move into their next role. Oh. Um, so there's a little bit of a, I don't want to say gray area, but there's a little bit of a jump that needs to happen um, for them to move into the responsibilities of the new role as they're outgrowing the previous role. So we usually put together a similar roadmap of how they need to get there um, and track performance accordingly um, and just stay really close with our people. And that's that's how we handle it. Okay, that's helpful. Now, what about onboarding people? So you talked about existing employees and their professional development. What do you do to make sure that people are onboarded effectively, that they're mentored effectively in the early parts of the job? Yeah. Admittedly, this is an area where we were, uh, well, I very specifically was very bad early on mm -hmm. um, because I think this is one of the areas where the first couple of weeks of, a, of an employee's experience working for you really set the tone for how the rest of the employment experience is going to be. So with the first couple of hires, it was me as an overworked freelancer, hiring a couple of people to help me out and not being able to dedicate the amount of time that I needed to dedicate to help mm -hmm. them be successful. And so what we built out was this system where we would do, I would do daily check-ins with everybody. Well, first, let me start. The first thing I would do is ask everybody to start a Google Doc and just take notes on the experience and tell me where I you know, missed the mark personally in their mm -hmm. onboarding. And the first couple people, there was like a page, two pages, and then it got down to a paragraph or two paragraphs to sentence to one, you know, and it kept getting shorter and shorter, those feedback hmm. uh, um, documents. Um, but we started doing um, like check-ins, almost like, uh, you know, daily stand-ups for 15, 20 minutes at the very beginning of the day and make sure that, you know, if there was any issues that I understood them hmm. and that we were working through them, um, and then regular weekly meetings. And then uh, we would do client meetings as we would onboard people and mm. uh, do the actual client meeting where we would prep for the client meeting and then the meeting where mm -hmm. we talk tactically about the, the work. So again, it was just about over communicating and making yourself more available, which is I think mm -hmm. one of the big differences between remote work culture and in office culture. Yeah. At an in office culture, it's very easy for you to just sort of you know, peek your head in between monitors and ask some questions of your neighbors, mm -hmm. whereas you need to be a little bit more intentional on the remote side and you need to set up a space for those types of conversations to happen that might otherwise happen a little bit more organically in, mm -hmm. in an in an in-office situation. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's helpful. Interesting. So 
uh, something I've helped like 26 companies figure out their flexible work schedule. And you talked about onboarding, which is great, but you didn't mention mentoring, which I think is very important. And I found mm -hmm. that to be quite crucial for getting junior team members from not, not for those first three months, but from the first three months to the first yeah. three years to have them be really successful. So I'm curious if you do any mentoring from other people, not from yourself, not coaching, yeah. meaning not direct supervision, but having mentors for your people within your team. Yeah, I'm sorry. I also would describe like how our onboarding process developed and uh, evolved over time rather than um, where it is now. So like where it is now, we have uh, a new hire buddy to help sort of like help you navigate mm -hmm. things as you get yeah. through. And then we have uh, an informal mentorship program where you mm -hmm. work with someone who is usually not your manager, occasionally is your manager um, that helps you sort of navigate longer term things because mm -hmm. the, the new hire buddy specifically is somebody who is definitely not your manager because there's a lot of things as a new yeah. hire, you maybe don't bring up because you don't want to bring it up to your manager because you don't want to be seen as, you know, not knowing what you're doing or being ill-prepared mm -hmm. or being, you know, having missed something they told you and then you can't figure out where it is. It's a lot lower risk to go to somebody who is a peer yeah. and ask them that, that that help for that help than it is for you to ask that of your manager. So we set up a, a, an environment for that to happen. Mm -hmm. And admittedly right now, the mentorship program for us internally is very informal and it probably should be something mm -hmm. that we formalize over the course of the next year. Because um, yeah. I think that's a really good point that you make is we've sort of built, formalized a process around new hire mentorship, or not really necessarily mentorship, but like assistance um, to get them up to speed, but not necessarily longer term. Um, mm -hmm. But we do have that very much as an informal process where we have, you know, and, and it usually comes about pretty organically where, you know, people who work together um, help each other out over the longer term to get where they need to be uh, personally and professionally as an employee here. Yeah, it sounds like a good plan to make it more structured over the next year. Now, I want to uh, also ask you something you mentioned before about the communication between different folks. So how do you facilitate effective team collaboration and communication in these remote settings? Um, wait, sorry, can you repeat the question? I, I just want to make sure that I answered it uh, sure. appropriately. How do you facilitate effective remote communication and collaboration? Yeah. Yeah, so I think one of the big things that we try to do is, like I said before, is trying to create spaces for that collaboration to happen because mm -hmm. it will happen a little bit. It's harder for it to happen more organically. So we will um, set short checkups, check-ins on certain projects that we're working on to make sure that there is opportunities for those. Um, and right now we're actually in the process of finding opportunities for our two departments to work together more uh, frequently and building a, an environment where we can do that more effectively. So the big thing for us, though, that or that I found personally is that um, leadership needs to be more of a forcing function and making sure that those happen because, mm -hmm. you know, like I mentioned, and when I've worked in office, it's really easy to sort of sit in a pod and like be able to ask questions of your neighbor. It's a lot mm -hmm. more difficult and not everybody's skill set to be able to do that um, in a remote setting. Certain people adopt that process really easily in a remote setting, but not everybody mm -hmm. does. So being able to encourage someone who might otherwise be a little bit more introverted to work on a project collaborating with another employee, like being more intentional about how you set up those meetings so that those actually happen um, has been something that we've really focused on doing here rather than just counting on them happening happening uh, organically as you would in, in, in an in-office setting. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Tyler. Is there anything else I haven't asked you that you would like to share before we wrap up? Um, I mean, I think one of the big things that I just love talking about is just, I think remote work is such an important part of the evolution of work that I'm really mm -hmm. excited to see how things go. And I think mm -hmm. all of these things that I've talked about are really the way that I would have liked to have been treated in an in office mm -hmm. situation also. So I think the big thing is when people hear people talking about remote work and how they're treating things and how they're handling um, their people in these remote work settings, um, there's a lot to be learned here for in-office culture too, because a lot of yes. these things are born out of the fact that I didn't get the support that I wanted to get when mm -hmm. I was working in an office. And these were just my way of adopting strategies to deal with it. Um, mm -hmm. And I did it in a remote setting because personally what I wanted for myself was a location independent lifestyle so that I could, mm -hmm. you know, 
do what I wanted to do and build a, a job that fit my life rather than fitting my life around a job. Mm -hmm. um, but I still wish that like, I probably wouldn't be here if like the companies that I worked for adopted mm -hmm. these strategies um, to their in-office culture as well. So um, yeah, that's the last like soapbox spiel I'll give. <laughs> No, that's a really nice message to end on, Tyler. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your time. Yeah, thank you. This was great. Excellent. And thank you to the audience for checking out another episode of the Wise Decision Maker Show. Please make sure to subscribe wherever you checked out the show and leave a review. It helps others discover the show and helps us improve the show.